This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our transmasculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, transmasculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. So I'm here with Cole from the Brown Boy Project, and we're basically going to be talking a little bit about the project, as well as their new health guide that they just came out with. I know we talked about this project on episode 14 when Jesse returned from Butch Voices. Jesse did a class, I think the workout type of class, around exercise at the conference and really enjoyed it. And so was really excited to talk to Cole there at the conference, as well as get the word out about this awesome new health guide. So I'm here with Cole, and Cole, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Fantastic to be joining you. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk about the work. My name is Cole. I prefer female pronouns. I identify as masculine of center, and I've been doing organizing and and activist work since I was about 14. And so in a lot of ways, for me, the Brown Boy Project is kind of a manifestation of all of the things that I love best about gender and masculinity in particular when it is at its best. So I'm excited just to just share a little bit more about our work. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how the project came to be and the vision and mission of the founders? Yeah, so the Brown Boy Project really in its kind of current state really came to be in 2007 in terms of the idea. But I've been working for a long time actually with straight men around gender and identity and masculinity really informally. But in 07, I got the opportunity to go to grad school and study for the master's in science, my MSc at the London School of Economics in gender and research statistics, which essentially was perfect nirvana, academic nirvana for me, because I am both a numbers and quant geek um, and a gender geek. So it was in so many ways the opportunity to, to do this work transnationally, to think about it. And I went there to study what at the time in academia was still really being talked about as female masculinity and thinking about how the primary narrative that I had grown up knowing and that kind of circulated in communities that I was living in at the time, both in the U.S. and abroad, was Butch, and that Butch had a very clear image that came to mind that was white, it was working class, it was leather clad, it was in a bar, and how I wondered just really deeply where were the narratives of folks of color Um, And where was masculinity allowed to live in our bodies? And in what ways were we able to embody it that was seen as credible and authentic and real in society as folks that still identified as women or along a trans masculine spectrum? So it was great. I did all this research. I got to spend time at the Lesbian History Archives. And it occurred to me fairly close to the end of my program that I could spend the next 20, 30 years studying this work and arguing with two or three other theorists around the world. We'd probably be the only ones that ever read each other's work, but we'd know it inside and out and have this great theoretical debate. But that really the question of like, where would it go beyond that? How would it live in a way that people every day in communities that I love and that I've lived in and done my activist work in over the last, you know, 15 years would never actually be able to see it or to use it in a real and tangible way. So for me, The Brown Boy Project is the reincarnation of what that gender work looks like when broken down in a way that we can bring it into our lives because we live it every day. We just don't have frameworks to be able to talk to each other about it. And so many of us are so isolated and there's so much intense competition that gets built up between us that the ability to do community building is really, really challenging. So the Brown Boy Project brings together masculine of center women, folks that identify as Stud, Butch, A.G., Dom, Macha, Tom, as well as trans men of color, queer men of color, and straight men of color. And that cross-section, when Malachi, Larry Garza, and I first sat down and think about like the first cohort that would come together, really, for us, we wanted to make the space as accessible across gender, as accessible across class, and across education as possible. And for that reason, really centralized, like lived experiences of being really central to the work. So it's exciting. And just in a short amount of time, we only have folks for five days, really in such a short amount of time, we transform ourselves so much. And I think that that's part of why the Brown Boy Project has taken off and why people are so excited. We're just a year and a half this month. And there's so much energy behind it. 
Yeah, I can really agree with the narrative. I remember coming out as a lesbian back in 1998 and progressively presenting more and more butch as I was allowed to because I was living in San Francisco. I certainly remember having access to works like Stone Butch Blues, where it was a very white working class, motorcycle riding, leather wearing kind of narrative. And I remember that I didn't hear anything about people of color and their narrative and how they interacted with their communities and what that looked like on a cultural level and a family level and what it was to be gender nonconforming in different backgrounds. So I wonder, just, I mean, as a personal question, Brown Boy Project has been around for a year and a half, but have you seen a significant shift, say, in the last five or ten years around that narrative changing and if you do feel it's changing what do you feel the main source is for that i do feel like it's changing some and i i guess i would attribute that to a couple of factors one i feel like folks that come are coming up now that are significantly younger than me i just continue to be impressed with how willing they are to say like your framework it doesn't work for me and that across race a lot of young white folks using genderqueer in a way that really goes against frameworks that were handed to them by elders in the community who have always identified as butch and really just thinking in more nuanced ways about gender. So there's one that folks of color who are along a genderqueer spectrum or identify as masculine of center, those stories are emerging more into the mainstream. And I also, though, think that they're still so limited, which is that the ways in which I get to be masculine of center is if I embody a masculinity, a black male masculinity that's really accessible. So if my identity is one that is of like in the vein of a hip hop mogul or in the vein of a thug or in the vein of someone who's super hood, then people are able to say, oh, okay, I recognize and see your masculinity. And so much of gender is about our own internal journey, but also about having external validation, like being able to be seen in the world in the way that we want to walk. And so where I feel like there's still a lot of room is around just more complicated and gray forms of masculinity that historically have been always present in communities of color. The idea of nurturing men and like, you know, strong women just thinking about gender because of the ways in which our communities have been pushed to the margins. We've been hybrid and in so many ways gender fluid for centuries. And so being able to like draw on those identities and still be able to be part of a mainstream queer community, we're a ways off from that. But I have a lot of hope because I really think that young folks are able to speak for what they want and what they need. And organizations like ours that are doing this work are making our work visible in a way that becomes a lightning rod. And then other people who are interested in engaging the conversation are able to go there to that space. So what are your goals for the Brown Boy Project and what current projects would you like to tell us about today? World takeover. (laughs) (laughs) Not domination, just takeover. Yeah, um, it is a running joke that I am affectionately referred to as the godfather or el padrino. Um, And in a lot of ways, so much of our work is about building social capital and creating opportunity and thinking about how we actually break down the silos and the competition that exists between us and realize that those walls have been put up very intentionally, whether around race, around class, around gender, to disempower us and to actually rob us of our greatest resource, which is each other. So in that way, I really do mean world takeover. But I also think that what we're really excited about and where the work is growing right now is so much of our work is about thinking about how masculinity operates. And that's really hard because for most of us as folks of color, we've seen our lives through a lens of oppression in ways that we have been marginalized from power. And that's so central to who we are that it's often difficult for us as people of color, for queer folks, for women, for folks to actually around class to be able to see the privilege they do have if they have any spaces in which they're marginalized. And the way that we talk about it is that we're complex beings, that we can move from one experience where we have power to another experience where we don't. And we can have experiences where we both have power and oppression operating at the same time. And how do we take responsibility for the power that we do have. So our thinking of masculinity is that really it's socially constructed on three axes, one of which is mental health. And not so much that, oh, we think that men, like in order to be defined as men, you must be brilliant, but rather that being intellectually inferior or irrational, supercilious, those things have been defined as feminine in our society. 
in real deep ways. So mental health issues actually become questions of gender for folks along a masculine spectrum in the same way that physical strength is also one of those cornerstones that's tied to virility, being physically strong. And so physical weakness also creates all kinds of questions around identity for folks along the masculine spectrum. And then the third, of course, is like being the breadwinner and economic self-sufficiency, that when anything happens in one of those three areas, it really quickly creates a downward spiral internally. In addition, creating additional barriers to seeking support and services because now we're questioning, like, am I really in charge of this family? Am I really the authentic leader? Am I really a man? Am I really masculine enough? So our work within the Brown Boy Project focuses pretty heavily on economic self-sufficiency and building social capital. But I was like, you know, we really need something stronger along the health spectrum. And I looked out and we did a ton of research. And most of what was out there was either like very accessible, super popular education, and it was 90% about sex. And we are very good. The world now officially knows that queer and trans folks, we are the best at having sex. We talk about it a lot. There's a lot of research about it, a lot of data to back that up. But so much more of our health goes beyond sex. And then when you look on the other end of the spectrum at like mental health and physical health and diet, everything is like as thick as a textbook. And it's, it's written that way, usually made for providers. So there isn't really anything in between. And originally, we just wanted to make the guide to give to our young leaders because we work with folks that are 35 and under. We thought we'll make this and make it available to our folks. And I think as a testament to, again, how little resources there are out there for us to be able to see things and images that reflect our bodies and reflect our stories and to really centralize all of our health questions. It's been exciting to see how powerful the book has become for folks. And so we're really, really excited to be able to share it and to think about what it looks like to get it into community centers and health centers and universities around the country so that it actually lands in the hands of somebody who's just beginning their journey to figure out how to find alignment with themselves. I think I had seven questions come up during that time. I wish I had a notebook. We're doing this interview in Oakland, by the way, so this is kind of uh, outside of the gender cast scope there in the Pacific Northwest and on the fly. But one of the things that Cole was talking about was the health guide that just came out. And I know Jesse had talked about this the previous episode when they were talking about images that reflect our bodies. One of the things that I really got out of the book when I was just kind of skimming through when Jesse brought it back was that they have diagrams of genitalia that reflects my genitalia now. Versus typically, when you see textbook of cis female genitalia, you have a very different diagram than when you do and if you've been on testosterone for a little while and the guys that are on hormones. I know you know what we're talking about, but even though we talk about it within our inner circles, it's really something that even at a medical professional's office, you're never going to see. So I really did think that was cutting edge of sorts because for whatever reason, it's like this thing that we don't want to talk about and I think gives us more body issues around the fact that we can't see our stuff in any kind of diagram or any kind of pictures unless it's sex related. The other thing that I know that we've talked about in a couple of different episodes is around divisiveness within our community and I think it's really great what the project is doing and I know that Butch Voices did take the masculine of center terminology from the Brown Boy Project and for me, that's something that fits now as I identify as transgendered, and it would have fit if I was still identifying as a butch female, and I really like that term. So as we talk about the divisiveness, I know we talked a lot about divisiveness at the Butch Voices Conference and trying to hold space for inclusiveness as well as self-identification, and Cole was at the Butch Voices, and I believe you presented a couple workshops there, correct? So why don't you talk to us about the term masculine of center and how that is in relation to how you identify and your own experience at Bush Voices and what opportunities you see there for a more inclusive or solid community. Yeah, it was really powerful. We had, for the first time really at any national queer conference that was intergenerational, a youth track that was run, facilitated, and led and designed by um, queer youth under 21 because usually also youth means like folks that are in college um, as opposed to like including high school age youth as well as those that are in college so we had 14 and 15 year olds that were training and facilitating and doing workshops on coming out with a huge intergenerational spectrum of folks talking about what it was like to come out 40 years ago and 20 years ago and then youth talking about what it's like to come out now as well as topics like health and suicide and so 
in so many ways, I feel like they really held a powerful space. And at the previous national conference, there were two people there that were under 24. And so you could totally feel that the energy shift and the, the momentum that they brought to the conference. And I just really respect that in so many ways, Butch Voices is trying to be really intentional about like, what does it mean to make this space accessible across so many different axes? And it's a hard job to be the big tent, the big umbrella. It's something that the Brown Boy Project doesn't do. Like we offer like a, a smaller tent, you know, which is a unifying tent in and of itself. But I think that for me, so much of the conversation around masculine of center is both real valid questions around how are we obscuring female identified folks within a movement and how is there pressure to transition? And I think our health guide touches on this as well, which is like, I am 33. I've been out since I was 19, I identify as masculine of center and I feel pressure to transition all the time. And I'm like pretty solid in who I am at this point. People transition me all the time. And I understand that in some ways it's about like making more space accessible to trans folks. But I also know that had I not lived the life that I've lived, I wouldn't be as clear and anchored in who I am. And in the same breath, there's so much transphobia that exists within queer communities and particularly within communities like lesbian communities that has a real deep history. And I think, again, it's like this question of like, it's not black and white, it's gray as hell. And how do we really honestly talk about that? in a way that makes sense and that there is both a valid question about like where are spaces for female identified folks and that they need to exist and be supported and as a movement really if we are not continually thinking about how we broaden the tent and how we extend accessibility in ways that it was not offered to us we are not evolving and i think that that's why we're so proud and really honored to support butch voices and think about what it means for our community which is i was saying this with a couple of elders on the friday night of the conference we all remember what it was like to be in our 20s and have someone who was older in the queer community tell us that one we didn't belong and that two who we were becoming was not authentic that it wasn't real and it wasn't welcome and i think that we have the advantage of wisdom and time to be able to offer a different perspective to folks that are coming to the tent now to actually say like I love you and you totally have a space at this table and let me tell you your history and where you come from and why you are standing in the place that you are now and to be able to break bread in that way that is very mutual so I think that I had no idea that they were going to take on Masculine of Center and integrate it. And the reason we use it is because it increasingly is an identity that folks um, are drawn to. And I really believe that identity can only be self-chosen. And that is very true. No one can offer anyone else an identity. And we're simply trying to find ways to be able to speak to the political unity that lies in our experiences while recognizing that there's a very rich and powerful distinction in all of us that come to the table and how can we both come together and separate in ways that make sense. And I think that we try to embody that. Like we're an organization that provides support to people of color and we see so much value in building with white folks along a masculine spectrum and like Butch Voices is one of the spaces that we access nationally to be able to do that alliance building work as well as to support people of color and it's possible to do both to be able to say for groups and there was a lot that was happening there was a lot of anger that last day of the community forum was really intense to the point where people had health issues. Like I was really surprised at how intense it got so quickly and how close to it being physically violent it ended up being in a way that I just was really, really surprised. And I continue to think about just how necessary it is for us to continue to do movement building, that it is both really critically important to have spaces in a lot of ways. Some of the folks there were saying we want spaces specifically for female identified folks and their allies and that that's really important and an organization like Butch Voices needs to exist so that the whole tribe can go and that we can actually come together in so many different ways and spaces. So I think that what is exciting to me in any movement, there are going to be, like, as you grow, <laughs> there are pains. There are growing pains that stretch us and push us in really hard and challenging ways. But I think that what's 
exciting about this moment and this opportunity is that people really came away from the conference recognizing a need for both. Like, oh, I totally get that, why you would want that space, and that makes sense. And like, I wanna think about how I can support that space, even if I don't identify as female, like how can I make that space accessible to other folks that do? And similarly, how can we then support and really deepen the reach of Butch Voices and have them connect? So for me, I feel really excited about that conversation because I also think it's one that happens under the surface in our community that people aren't willing to really engage because it's painful and because it has so much history. I totally have to agree with you in a number of things that you said. One, having spent most of my 20s as a butch identified female and being in the Bay Area where self-identification is much more robust than a lot of other places because you have that ability to be exactly who you are and the city tends to be really tolerant. So I think I've had the same experience in the sense that I've too have felt pressure to transition before I was ready. And I think that that's why it took me so long is I had to check in with politically how I wanted to be aligned with breaking ranks as far as expanding that box of a female and wanting to kind of fight that fight. Uh, in addition to seeing friends transition and feeling like there wasn't many butches left any longer. And then even generationally watching the new younger queers come up and for me, my personal experience is it feels less inclined to be on either the butch or femme side, that it's a lot of gray now and a lot of self-identification as far as androgynous or gender queer and not wanting to subscribe to kind of the old ways, which is, you know, something we talk about because I feel like one of the biggest fears with the butch community, especially the older community, is that they feel like they're losing their history, that they're losing numbers and they're losing some of their history and that feels threatening. But also, you know, I always say that the, the butch component is the reason why we have the ability to identify as genderqueer or even have the ability to transition because that component was the first gender nonconforming in a masculine sense within the queer community. It's the first taste of, of gender nonconformity that the majority of society has seen. And we even talked about, we use Rocco Bulldagger's The End of Gender Queer and feeling like because what butch was back then and they termed it genderqueer, now the word butch is somehow like related to Budweiser and motorcycles and none of the new kids want to be associated with Butch now. As, you know, I'm really torn in both ways, but I feel that there is a real difference between some of my concerns and my my perspective now as I'm transitioning than what was happening with me when I was female identified and gender nonconforming. So I think that there needs to be spaces, but I do feel like there's a lot of overlap. And I agree that there's a lot of, you know, with any kind of evolution of a movement, there is going to be pains. And ideally, we'll have this discussion. We'll keep having this discussion both locally and in conference settings such as Butch Voices, and I, and I hope that we can all keep coming back to the table and really listen and really be able to say, this is not my experience now, or it isn't any longer, but realize that it's a valid experience, and there's certainly a lot of overlap with our concerns. What would you say has been one of the largest challenges you've faced, and if you have a success story or something that you feel you've been really successful at thus far? I think that one of the biggest challenges that we faced is starting, you know, we, we launched the organization at the beginning of 2010, and really 2010 and, and 2011 have been incredibly horrific times for nonprofits and social justice organizations around the country. Just financially, so many organizations have closed, and so many organizations have seen their budgets cut and slashed. And so to be starting something new in a time where a lot of foundation and philanthropic partners were saying to themselves, we're cutting our budget this year, let's make sure that we support the organizations, the core organizations we've always supported, that it was super, super challenging. And we talk so much in BBP about how our root is one that really focuses on like how we take also personal and financial responsibility for the organization. And so our greatest challenge is also, I think, in a lot of ways, one of our big successes, which is that in the beginning, I paid for the project myself, like out of pocket and made it happen and was able to produce the first retreat and the first experiences that really helped pave the way and allowed me to be able to invite funders in to see the magic and just kind of what was possible with this work. And that that continues today, that so many of our brown boys give their actual money monthly as donors and their time and their love and their energy. And I think that that is the thing that I'm the most proud of. We've, at this point, trained over 74 young leaders in a year and a half, and they are phenomenal. And they are supporting each other and doing work in courageous, courageous ways. It's so challenging to be a leader 
in this world and even more challenging to be a leader who is pushing a view or a perspective that goes against the societal grain. And I think that folks who are masculine identified talking about privilege and really calling us accountable for the fact that we live in a society that demonizes femininity. And similar to questions of race and class, like if it's ever going to change at a societal level in a fundamental way, those of us with privilege have to be really central to pushing back and transforming that piece. And I think that that's really hard and a lot of folks don't want to hear it. And anytime you step out there as a leader, you make yourself a target in ways that so many of us know is really challenging and dangerous. And I just continue to be amazed at how courageous they are and how willing they are to push themselves and each other in really, really fundamental ways that go against like all of who you've been or all of who we've each been most of our lives. And because of that, anyone who's met any of the brown boys is changed just by meeting them. And I am so excited for what our potential and where we will go as we increase the number of leaders that we reach and think about all of the opportunities that we have to really open up an exciting national dialogue with like straight brothers at the table and trans brothers at the table and masculine center women at the table and queer men how do we hold that space and allow society to be able to come to the table with us is really exciting that's actually a perfect segue into the next question. Reaching out to communities of color, how would GenderCast do a better job of aligning politically with that community? And do you have any suggestions or what's your hope for allies? You know, it's always interesting how difficult and how simple it is to do this work and to answer these questions at the same time, right? I think so much about what if there was an organization around gender that was really trying to have gender non-conforming folks at the table and what would it really take to make that space, like to have you and, and Jesse really come to the table and be invested. And like thinking about those questions in our own lives actually helps us to have a sense of what that work looks like that we have to do for other folks. And it usually is pretty huge in terms of shifting our culture, shifting power and access and decision making. In order for that to really work, it would mean that people of color would have to be deeply invested in the work and the decision making and the magic <laughs> that is gender cast in order to say to themselves, this is something that I want to bring my entire community to and that you would feel the same way if someone was asking you to come to the table to represent a gendered slice of life. And knowing that that table didn't originate in that space and place, you would think really deeply about like the authenticity and how you could do that with integrity and bring it to your community in a way that really supported folks as opposed to increasingly tokenizing our experiences and further marginalizing us around power. So like, what does that really look like? Is really, what is the community-based way that you take this podcast to the ground and think about doing that in real and meaningful ways and partnering with organizations that are led by people of color that are doing work in queer communities and inviting them to set the agenda and to really think about what is the conversation that intersects with gender cast work that they want to have and how can you create the incubator and the space to amplify that so that it's shared with communities of color around the country and then that way it's an opportunity for them to be able to think about how do we use this platform how do we leverage this how do we share our work with communities around the country and then it also gives you a way to actually make that space and increasingly over time they become deeply invested like the reason that the Brown Boy Project supports Butch Voices in the way that we are as a multiracial organization is that they really walk the talk. There are so many organizations nationally that are trying to bring people of color into primarily white spaces. And it's not just actually about bodies in a room. It's actually about thinking about from the very beginning, how does this impact communities of which I really don't belong. And the only way you can answer those questions is if folks who are part of those communities are sitting at the table in the beginning. And for us, I think so much of it is like there's so many people that are doing this work wrong in the world. And that's like as queer folks, as people of color, that we really need to celebrate and honor and align ourselves with folks who are really trying to do it right, knowing that all of us are going to make mistakes and stumble along the way, but that that's what genuine partnership is about. And that it, by investing in each other, we actually help to create more models of what that looks like and how it's done with integrity in the world. 
So part of it, too, is just thinking about our social circle. Our social circles look very much like us. You know, and this is a challenge within any organization's work. You know, my constant challenge is to make sure that as someone who is black and that our culture of the Brown Boy Project is not one that is culturally dominant by black folks. Like, and how do I hold that space and how do I push my circles and how do I think about the limitations of my own circles in doing the work? So I know that there are folks of color in Seattle and I think part of it is also like our social circles look so much like us that it's often difficult to push past them. And it requires work, but it's really important. It's like the, the hard work, but it's really, really essential to do that work. So, so you know, New York had a hard time too. <laughs> Okay, so we have a few questions about the book, The Health Guide, that we talked about earlier. And again, you can find this book for sale on the website, and we will post links to both the website as well as The Health Guide. But I guess there's a chapter called Freeing Ourselves, A Guide to Health and Self-Love for Brown Boys. So that is the title of the book. And I guess Jesse had a real interest in Chapter 4, Holistic Care Through Gender Transition. I know we've done a couple episodes on self-care, and we talked about a variety of ways. So... Can you talk about how this chapter came to be and why it's important to include it? Yeah, so I've been describing the health guide as one part Tumblr, one part Our Bodies, Ourselves remix, and one part just beautiful ass coffee book. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly enough, that chapter was the last one to formally come together because it was really, really difficult. The book draws on like a whole, whether it's in the mental health work or whether it's in the physical health interacting with a physician or the whole section on thinking about transitioning and androgen therapy, which is like the most popular way to transition, that throughout all of those threads, we wanted to talk about what is the real accessible language that you can use in a doctor's office that will help to break down the challenges and those barriers that exist with healthcare providers. Because what we actually found in having this conversation and through conversations with healthcare providers is that usually actually gender nonconforming folks get less service. People are so challenged by your gender nonconformity that they're just trying to get you out of their office as quickly as possible. And so in a lot of ways, the questions we should be asking or the support we should be getting, we don't have time to. And we found that just in the little time since the guide has come out, being able to access clinical language immediately puts you on the same page. It's like you're almost speaking the same language as the healthcare provider, and they instantly see you in a different way and are more invested in you. So that was really important to us, but we also really wanted to bring in herbal, like think about kind of non-Western ways of approaching health and integrating them. Like what does it mean to have a traditional healthcare provider, but then also to like think about herbs and Eastern medicine in terms of putting together a more holistic approach. And I think the other challenge with transitioning, you know, all of us have had to make decisions about how to find alignment with our body. If we feel like our body, as it was given to us, isn't quite the, the home we want to live in and walk the journey of. And that traditionally, kind of the only option that's been offered is like, okay, we'll start tea and then transition. That this is pretty much, that's how you, you find nirvana. And for a lot of folks that did that, particularly early on in the day, it didn't quite do everything that they wanted it to do. And so what we wanted to put together is how could we jam pack a book so that it would be like a choose your own adventure? Like, oh, yes, I want this and I want that and I want this well, for everyone to be able to figure out their own personal journey. So this chapter is really one. It holds a whole piece on talking specifically about what are all of the really exciting things that you can expect and some of the challenges that you'll expect around tea and how do you mitigate them and how do you use herbal work? to actually be able to not only take care of side effects, but to actually make your transition smoother and safer. And the herbalist who we worked with, Jacoby Ballard, is in the U.S., one of the foremost herbalists that's been doing this work the longest with trans and gender nonconforming people, which is also something like there aren't a whole lot of people in the world for whom this is their life work. And so another thing that was really important to us in putting the guide together was like, let's find the dopest and the baddest practitioners we can for whom this is the work and the communities that they love and like bring them all together and centralize them. So it's got a lot of great pieces. And also in that chapter throughout the book, there's a lot of personal story and narrative about what does it mean to transition? There's a powerful, powerful piece around bottom surgery in there and the stigmatization that still exists pretty intensely around bottom surgery within our community. And 
why this person talking about their own journey and how they found alignment through that and the ways in which they did it and like really explicitly and graphically what it was like to go through the process so that other folks who are thinking about this work can actually look through that. And I think early on, so much of this happened online in terms of being able to share story and narrative, but the piece and the thread that was always missing to that was, well, what would it look like to have a healthcare provider who was my ally and right there with me every step of the way? This is what you're seeing and you're reading and hearing, and here's something else that you should factor in to that conversation. And so we wanted to be able to provide folks with a healthcare provider, and whether it's Sara Flores, who's one of the primary authors and the original co-visionary for the guide, who's a nurse practitioner, or Erica Woodland, who is an amazing mental health specialist, you actually have all of them in your pocket when you get the guide walking that journey with you in a way that's really powerful. And we've had folks who've taken the guide with them to meet with a healthcare provider to be able to use the imagery to open up a conversation so that it begins to bring other folks into the journey. Yeah, it's such a powerful tool to be able to advocate for yourself, especially in, in mental health and medical arenas. And I feel really lucky having the opportunity, because I live in Seattle, to have a naturopath as my doctor, who's also a trans man. So not having to go through all of the different steps and, and try to explain to them on every level because they have a, a personal experience as well as just a long time. But I can't stress how important it is to really take a long look, whether or not you are thinking about transitioning and using hormones, whether or not uh, you want to go the more natural transition way, which is just to masculinize your body through diet and exercise, as well as some herbal supplements, or if you just have friends and you want to be an ally to someone that is going through that process. I think it's so important to be as informed as you can about all of the different options versus kind of being pressured or coerced into making somebody else's path your path. So definitely this chapter seems to be pretty well researched and a great resource. And I think what I had been thinking when you were talking was, wow, wouldn't it be awesome to have every provider have access to this book and it be in even the waiting room, how awesome it would be just so that people have an awareness that not everybody is living the binary and everybody's body fits into the binary and it would be such a powerful tool if we had that. Jesse also wanted me to in place of Jesse being here, talk about how awesome the artwork is. And you had mentioned earlier about uh, a great coffee table book. It's so realistic, is their comment. Uh, Jesse loves it. <laughs> so can you talk about the artwork and, and how that went into the planning of the book and perhaps some of the artists that are featured? Yes, absolutely. So the first, I mentioned Sara Flores, who is a nurse practitioner. I had a vision for this health guide, but let me tell you, I know I know nothing about it. <laughs> and it's amazing how manifesting, like just how powerful manifesting is. And I put it out into the universe and I started talking about it. And randomly, we ended up in a bar in Detroit at the U.S. Social Forum. And I was talking about this vision because she was a nurse practitioner and she pulled out these amazing images that became the start of the book, really. And they were put together by an artist whose name is Elijah Odette. And the conversation around how these pieces came together was actually bringing a group of trans men together to have a conversation, to sit around and then actually like use their bodies to create sketches that became the very beginning of the book. And so as we started to reach out to folks in the community, so many people have been so heavily invested in this work for such a long time. Our chief artist, her name is Corinna Nicole, and she just finished her degree in art at UC Berkeley and had done a whole masculinities project and was really, really excited to think about what it looked like to do this art and her work that she did, which is included in the second section. She has one of her core pieces on page 35. And she originally, in order to make these images, she had to take photos of folks and then she sketched their bodies and then she reinserted organs back into the drawings after she finished them as a way of kind of creating the imagery. A lot of the images from the cover to pieces throughout our actual brown boys and young leaders. We partnered with Crashpad, which is a great, phenomenal porn site. We were trying to think to ourselves, where are we going to find people to do very graphic, safe sex photos? <laughs> and then somebody told me, a porn company. And so we were really excited to partner with Crashpad, and they made images available to us to be able to do. There's a whole section in here on stand p devices that were also we were able to draw from. So for us, Micah Bazant 
was our design and layout god uh, and chief kind of <laughs> I refer to him as curator of beauty and in so many ways what I said to Micah when we sat down was like I just wanted to be stunning I wanted to be as powerful and graphic and challenging and inspiring as we can make it because it has to be if people are going to pick it up and really want to read it and over and over again people have told me that they sat down with it and they read it cover to cover and have immediately integrated it into their life and I think that that's so important one for us to be able to see ourselves that way but also to know that someone cares enough about our bodies and our health and who we are to make something this beautiful and this powerful specifically for us. It certainly is amazing and beautiful, and I think Jesse had commented last episode about their plane ride home was cover to cover reading this book, and they couldn't wait to start again. So it seems like all that time and energy has produced a beautiful product, and it's really informative. The other question we were wanting to ask you was, how was it working with Patricia Manuel for the weight training chapter? Amazing. So <laughs> Patricia is right now conditioning and training and competing to be the first queer woman to box on the 2012 Olympic team. It's the first time they've ever allowed women's boxing to be part of the Olympics. And when we first connected, I was telling her, like, this is what the Brown Boy Project is. And we have this whole section on physical health. And we were just hoping that you might be able to send us a couple of images and tell us about your story. And she was so inspired through the process that when we later on were looking for, like, I was like, we need a small routine to actually, like, make this real for folks. <laughs> and she went to, she lives in Long Beach. She went to the beach, like, with a photographer, and they were there all day and did a whole photo shoot and then essentially sent us almost 10 pages worth of a workout that she designed and really just talked so much about her own transition around health and body and how much she would have loved to have had a resource like this. And we actually got to meet for the first time at Butch Voices, which is just another reason that the conference was so amazing. Like people who've been doing work across the country and talking to each other through social media were actually able to hug and connect. And so it was just really exciting to be able to not only have her in the book, but to support her and to be able to see how possible it is now for so many of us to live lives that folks couldn't five or 10 years ago. But she's, she's pretty fabulous. <laughs> Just to reference, this is the workshop that Jesse did the push-ups at and kind of got demolished by, um, <laughs> by Patricia. But, you know, what do cause? I mean, she is training for the Olympics. All right, so the last thing was, did you want to talk a little bit about STDs and the importance of healthcare overall? Yeah, I think that in so many ways, historically, there's even though there's been a lot of talk about safe sex in our community, there actually isn't a lot of practicing. Like we actually have a whole section and it's titled Dental Dams Don't Do Shit, right? Which is just really honestly acknowledging the fact that there's still a lot of people who don't practice safe sex and how important it is to think about realistic ways to do that that actually facilitate even better sex while engaging and using them. And I think that part of the challenge for many of us is just that we have become so disassociated with our bodies over our journey, both because of our gender journey, as well as the fact that being masculine in this society is actually one where you're not rooted in your body. When you think about social movements of women, they're very rooted in like liberation of bodies and exploring and living in bodies. And it's actually really important for us to be able to live in our bodies and have access to them in order for us to take care of them. And I think that what is exciting to us about the book and just health overall is by starting a conversation with ourselves and then with each other, we actually find ways to learn to live within our body and to appreciate our body and to really take care of our body. Because for so many of us, we have across a whole range of things subjected our bodies to a lot. <laughs> We have really pushed our bodies to physical limits, to like, you know, pain limits while trying to figure out how to walk this journey. And they continue to love us back and they continue to take care of us. And I think that it is really on us to be able to create a reciprocal process and one that runs very parallel to finding alignment around our gender. And so we just hope that this guide goes a little bit of the way with folks and helps to open up a conversation that allows each of us to feel a little more at home in our bodies because it's so important to, to finding that space 
and making peace in a way with who we are and how we walk this world. Yeah, I would agree. And, and like I said before, one of my favorite things about this book is that it reflects accurately the anatomy of a trans man. And I think that for those of us that have decided to transition or for those of us that are gender nonconforming and female identified, it is hard to adjust to how the world sees us and, and our association with our bodies. And we know from previous research that because we have a hard time talking to providers about how those things don't align or we, we don't always have the best relationship with our reproductive organs or breasts that we are more inclined to develop breast cancer because we don't get seen, we don't get paps, we don't do these things. And so this is a great resource to help, I think, kind of bridge our internal dialogue with how we see our bodies and, and realizing that there's a community that also feels that way. And then there might be some insight with narratives in the book that will help us, as you said, live in our bodies a little better. But also it's such an easy resource to take with you to the gynecologist, to take with you to your primary care physician to talk about some of these things so that when you have your next appointment, it's not so dreaded. It, it, there's a dialogue there that they can at least appreciate where you're coming from in a different light than they, they may have before. So it's a really great guide and book. So I encourage you to check out the website. In January, the application process will start for the leadership retreat for Brown Boy. Where is that usually? And if folks are selected, um, we fly you out, put you up. Everything is covered. You go to the club on your own, but... <laughs> on us um, and I think we're really excited because we're trying to identify folks for whom they have a really strong passion and vision for change they want to see so I would say like if there's someone up in the Pacific Northwest who is really wanting to do work in communities of color and really build this work and is a brown boy they should definitely check out the application in January so both Jesse and I would just like to thank Cole for doing the interview we're airing this quite a bit after the actual interview was recorded. And so looking back, I just feel like this conversation really was influential in helping me kind of have some internal dialogue, the ideas of, of how communities talk to one another and, and what we're trying to do here on the podcast. And, and certainly some of the stuff that I have to both own. I mean, we did the privilege episode, but it, it's such an easier place to come from when you're just like researching and, and having ideas, but then having this interview with Cole and just knowing that they're doing such good work and they're so passionate about it. I think it hit home for me when Cole talked about my social groups reflect kind of my activism and knowing that I'm starting to look at all these things and to see how I move through this world. And so I really, really appreciated that. And I'm, I'm super happy we got this opportunity. I think one of the other things that came out of this conversation is when I got back and we had discussed the interview and I listened to it, I think some of the things that Jesse and I are looking at when we move forward with gender cast is really how to better reach out to communities and do that in a thoughtful way, looking how we can really incorporate other folks into this podcast and they can reflect and kind of take charge with their own ideas about what's happening in their communities and have their own narratives and, and we're really looking to do that. And so we are thinking about that in the future and, and hopefully we'll be able to bring that to you sometime soon. Yeah, so I just want to say thanks to both Sean and Cole for doing this interview that I pretty much just sort of decided and talked to Cole when I was at Butch Voices, kind of just decided on the spot that it would be important for us to do and kind of threw it at Sean. And he was a, definitely a willing participant in following through and making sure that the interview happened. And it, I thought it was really cool that I got to meet Cole and ask them to do the interview with us and then help Sean come up with some of the questions and then for Sean to go down and have this dialogue. So... I think that we are very lucky and I feel extremely honored that Cole was willing to take some of her time out of her day and sit down with Sean and have this conversation. And I've listened to the episode a couple times and will a few more. And I just think there's a lot of valuable lessons in there and that Cole is a very wise person. And so thank you, Cole. And thank you to the Brown Boy Project. I also just wanted to say quickly is I apologize for the mic. It wasn't super enjoyable to discover that by using this kind of mic that I traveled with, it did pick up this sound. So I'm sorry the quality is not as good because the content is so excellent for this episode. But I also want to just do a shout out that it's weird to not have Jesse on air. <laughs> it really is. Like sometimes we will take hours and hours to record an episode and like argue amongst ourselves with how we should present something or the order or someone got off topic. But I felt like I sounded like a dud in front of this really interesting 
articulate person because I was like not super aware of the project prior because Jesse really had the opportunity to talk to Cole while they were at Butch Voices. But I also just like didn't know when to pipe in. That makes me think of Halloween <laughs> when we dressed up as Chippendale dancers and the minute you would walk away and go outside or something, I'm like, my son. <laughs> so obviously doing this podcast together has made quite the partnership. <laughs> Some things just take two. (laughs) Okay, welcome to GenderCast 17 check-ins, and we have a few things to go over today. We're going to start out with talking about the most important thing that we've been working on, actually that Sean has been working on a lot. This is a project that he was really interested in taking on, and my participation has been pretty minimal. But that's the Trans Bodies, Trans Selves Forum, and I will turn it over to Sean to tell you more. We've been talking about this for a couple of months now, but we actually have the date finalized and actually just a few minutes ago released the Facebook invite and are firming up things, and we will have a blog post on this on our website as well. All right. So first, just a little bit about the project. And again, you can check out the Facebook event page, which has all of the links to the various pages about the project itself but basically this is a community forum and I was so happy to be involved with this because I really feel like it's rare that any community gets an opportunity to check in and discuss and like have some say into what's going to be a resource guide or a book that affects our community so largely so I love that the trans body trans cells folks have opened this up to community forums in various cities so that people in the community can come together and talk about stuff that they really want to be in the book before it's edited so the forum is basically going to be a bunch of small groups and they're going to be facilitated and there'll be a note taker and all of the notes from the dialogues that get addressed and and talked about in these small groups may get to some of the editors and authors to help shape their ideas and shape their content that will then be published sometime next year. So I just think it's an excellent opportunity. Not only will it be a great opportunity to just get together with other members of the community that you may not have access to all the time, but we've invited some really great people to be facilitators. So you'll also get to see some really great community leaders and hear what they're doing. And I hope that you guys come out. It's going to be on December 12th, which is a Monday at 6.30 at the Lifelong AIDS Alliance Annex Room. It should go for about an hour and a half to two hours. We do need help with volunteers, so if anybody wants to come a little earlier and help set up like chairs, or if they want to do sign-in, or if they want to volunteer preemptively to take notes, it would be great to have you uh, contact us at gendercast at gmail.com, and we'll, we'll go ahead and start that process. And just a shout-out to our allies. We would love for you to advertise and promote and get in touch with your trans and gender nonconforming folks. But this is an event for us. So we get to shape our forum, I guess. So I think it's okay for allies or other people that work with the trans community and other fashions to come and be observers. But as far as who gets to talk, this is really an event that is so that the trans community and gender nonconforming community can voice their thoughts around these things. So it won't be a good space for you to pipe in so much, but certainly you're welcome to come support and be an ally. The next thing I want to just address quickly, too, is if you haven't seen it already, our resource page has launched. So this is a a page that will be a continual work in progress. We've outlined some tabs. Not every single tab has stuff in it. We are still working with our lovely intern, Marissa, to get things short up and try to figure out kind of some of the structure for some of the pages. But it will be something that we will be continually working on. And there's quite a bit of information out there already. So please check that out. It's gendercast.resourcelist.com. Dot blogspot.com and you can link to it from our normal gendercast page under resources so the next thing i want to talk about is a u.s department of health and human services regional listening session for lgbt stakeholders and this was something i actually went to for a work group i sit on for my regular job <laughs> not not the podcast baby but I thought was useful and definitely relates back to some of the healthcare stuff that Sean and I are going to be talking about. We're going to spend the month of January focused on healthcare and have a lot of good planning going on to have some great people come on to GenderCast and talk about trans healthcare and access to healthcare. And so it's interesting because as we plan that episode and we talk about where we're kind of addressing healthcare from, and then we look where the federal government is at with it, it's pretty disparate. And so, you know, we're probably. 10 years ahead here in Seattle and with some of the work that's happening here in Seattle around trans health care than where I would say the U.S. government is at. But just to do some highlights, some of you may be aware of Charlene Strong, whose partner 
got caught in their house when there was a flood here in the Seattle Puget Sound area and wound up dying. And she's become a big sort of face and leader in the LNG community around healthcare and hospital visitation rights. And so that's actually made its way to the federal government. And now same-sex couples are included in the hospital visitation legal rights. And that was effective January of 2011. And that actually went into a memo that President Obama sent to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I think it's actually more broad than same-sex couples. I think it's stuff around actual chosen family, but I didn't look it up and give you specific information. I just know that the hospital visitation laws are much better now. So they talked about the things that they've accomplished, and one of the things, of course, that they called out was the Affordable Care Act, which is much broader than the LGBT community, but definitely affects the LGBT community, you know, that we can now stay on our parents' health care until we're 26. So, of course, that includes queer young people that are under 26 and their parents actually have health care. There's some new advanced directives that affect LGBT families, and hospitals have to respect the right of individuals and their wishes. And so whatever you have written in there and who you have it written about is up to you. There's some new stuff coming out around elders and long-term care. And then I was a little bit disturbed in what they were talking about around the youth and some anti-bullying efforts. And just thinking back to the episode that we did with put this on the map, that the anti-bullying stuff really doesn't cut the mustard. It's more about creating a liberation space. And I guess the feds have a website now called stopbullying.gov. be interesting to have somebody check that out and sort of deconstruct it. <laughs> So in sitting through this forum and talking about sort of some of what their highlights are moving forward, one of the things that they talked about was data collection. And this is something that I've been thinking about in a lot in terms of my work and working, you know, in human services and thinking about how data is collected about the LGBTQ community. And I've been thinking about it more in terms of the trans community. There was just a national health survey that's going to include sexual orientation that got pulled together and it's going to launch in 2013. And they also commissioned a report of a complete and thorough lip review of all LGBT research. And there's been more and more research on the LNG that's come out in the last 10 years, but it's like stark when it comes to the trans community. And other than the injustice at every turn report that we've talked about several times on this podcast, there's nothing. There's not a whole lot. I mean, there's a little bit, but very, very, very little that includes gender identity. And they don't have the question standardized even about asking the question around trans people. And I asked a question about this and I was like, how are you going to ask about gender identity? Because there's a lot of trans people out there that may identify if you have a male and female box, they may identify there and then you won't know that that's different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. And then what about all of the other category in terms of people that are maybe identify as trans but wouldn't necessarily check that box on a form because they want gender variant or they want gender nonconforming or they want gender queer and just all this language that we have. And the person that was talking about this, A.J. Perlman, said that they're still in the process of even trying to figure out what the question would be to ask and then how to standardize it. So they are looking at that. They're crying for more research that includes gender identity and that is about the trans community. So it's yet to come. So it's interesting because... I know one thing where I work is looking at doing is adding data items to try to collect that better at the county level. And, you know, there's just not a whole lot of like models out there yet. And if anybody out there knows of good ones, I know that individual organizations, maybe smaller community nonprofit organizations or other types of organizations have good ways of asking it. So I think that that's going to be valuable information to be coming out. So we did talk about employment a little bit. And as we've posted, there are a few federal government agencies like HUD that have included non-discrimination language around gender identity and have even included some trans health care. She talked about equal employment opportunity includes gender identity now and that anybody can file an equal opportunity complaint. And that's in effect. She also said that the Secretary of Health and Human Services is developing a new non-discrimination policy against all those eligible for health and human services programs that include sexual orientation and gender identity. So that would be anybody accessing their programs or anybody accessing anything that their programs fund. And there's tons of federal health and human services funding that comes to the state and the counties and the local 
government and local community-based resources that get federal government funding. So I know non-discrimination, legal stuff, it's not the be-all, end-all. And just because there's a law doesn't mean it's not going to happen in the workforce. But at least when it does happen, you have that law as leverage to get it to not keep happening. And I experienced a situation like that at my job. And it came in very handy that King County has gender identity included in our non-discrimination stuff. So I know that people are also very critical of non-discrimination law as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of other future goals that HHS had. I definitely think that they think they are conducting outreach to LGBT organizations. And I did see quite a few organizations at this listen-in. But A.J. Perlman, who is the liaison for the Health and Human Services Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs, actually gave us their email and said to email them with any ideas that we had about how HHS can do better or areas that we want to talk about and think about. And I have their email right here, and I will leave you with that. Their email was A.J. Perlman, P-E-A-R-L-M-A-N, at HHS.gov. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are upcoming local events, and there's been a lot going on in November, but by the time this podcast airs, most of the stuff will be over. But we do know that Lick is having their monthly party on Saturday, December 3rd, and this month they're doing a benefit for BENT, which is a queer writing institute here in Seattle, so that's pretty exciting. And Lick is our queer, trans, big crazy, fun, glitterified dance party here in Seattle that gets quite a community pull. Our next check-in is going to be a follow-up to the quick ball tournament that Sean and I played in. And I'll go ahead and let Sean tell you all about how well the tournament did. So as you know, GenderCast unfortunately did not win. Although we did, <laughs> we did fight hard for the big queer trophy. But it was a fundraiser and we're super happy that it was successful. So here's the info we got from Sid about the tourney. The first ever Seattle Quick Ball 2011 on October 16th was a total success. Over 250 people participated as players, volunteers, and spectators. The weather was good. The outfits were amazing. The turnout was all ages, and the spirit was very queer. 16 community activists were honored as team captains, including Sean and Jesse. Yay. (laughs) The event also raised over $5,000 for reteaching gender and sexuality and their ongoing media and education campaigns. Stay tuned for their new web video, PSA, which will be out later this month, featuring several RGS members and a song by men. That's awesome. They did do a a brief survey after the event, and one of the feedback lines was, it was really super fun. I loved all the camaraderie among the teams and the general vibe of the day. The website was polished and easy to understand. The people were awesome. And I can piggyback on the awesomeness. It was a really, really fun day. You can check out the Seattle Quick Ball webpage for outfit photos, as well as the gender cast photos, which some of them were super amazing. So a shout out to Ish for not only participating in Quick Ball fun, but taking photos of the entire event. So go ahead and check out their work on our Facebook page. The last thing we want to announce quickly is in regards to allyship, looking for people to be on their board of directors. So Debbie Carlson, the executive director, was on episode 13, and we talked a lot about the organization and what allyship does. They are a Seattle-based organization, and we really, really like them. So here's a little information about what they're looking for right now. Looking for individuals who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer individuals, and allies. They want a year and a half commitment, ideally, and they're looking for people that are willing to be on an executive fundraising or financial committee. The potential board members must have knowledge of nonprofit culture, knowledge of board duties and culture, a willingness to fundraise, a willingness to enhance the organization's public standing, a willingness to recruit new board members, and a knowledge of mainstream economic justice, immigrant rights, homeless, labor, and healthcare communities. So if anybody's interested, you can visit their webpage or contact Debbie directly at allyship at yahoo.com. And I'm sure they'd be glad to hear from you and talk about how you might fit and helping out. Thanks so much for listening. That wraps up episode 17 and we will be taking a slight break a mental health break as we call it it's almost like jesse and i are having a date night since we leave the the baby unintended for just a short period of time so we will be back to you in mid-december with a new episode and we'll be starting our health care focus thanks guys